Posso? Ok, good morning everybody, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, we are going to speak English. Uh, this is, uh, as you know from the program, it's, uh, um, it's a panel on Syria. And I think it's the perfect follow-up to the panels on Syria that we had at the festival in the last years. So uh, three years ago or something like that, we were speaking to representatives from Raqqa has been slaughtered silently. Uh, last year, we had Nura Gadi, who told us the story of uh, her husband, Basel. And now I'm very, uh, it's an honor <laughs> to have here Anwar al uh, who is a human rights lawyer, uh, Hadi al Khatib, the founder of the Syrian Archive, and Sara uh, Afshar, who is a filmmaker who made a wonderful documentary on Syria. Uh, what we are going to try to address today is the future, the future of Syria. Uh, what's going to happen in the coming months, what's going to happen in the coming years. Some of us thinks, think, uh, and I say some of us because I had several discussions with that one, <laughs> that the war is almost over and there is a new phase that is opening. And unfortunately, the revolution didn't work win for now. Uh, Anwar doesn't agree with me, so he will explain you everything later. So I, again, some of us. Uh, but I just think that it's a new phase for Syria, and it's a phase where we have to think about justice for the thousands of people who died or disappeared in Syria, and also memory. The struggle for memory is something that is not very often in the media these days when we talk about Syria, but it's going to be uh, very, very important for the future. And uh, Hadi can, um, can explain us uh, why. So I don't want to talk too long because uh, um, we only have one hour. I just want to say that it's very important to have this panel here in Italy because, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, Italy has been at the forefront of the European countries who are trying to normalize their relationship with Syria. Italy is thinking about reopening an embassy in Damascus. Italy invited Ali al Mavluk, the head of the uh, Syrian intelligence, military intelligence, here in Italy last year. So um, it is important to address these kind of topics in this country right now. So um, I want to start with, an, uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Francesca Gafferri and I work for La Repubblica and uh, I cover Syria <laughs> and the Middle East. Uh, I want to start with Anwar because Anwar is uh, building up a case which is really important and it's going to be the case. Uh, and what is putting together the testimony of the people who were in jail, who had uh, friends and family members who disappeared, got killed, got tortured in the prisons in jail in Syria. And thanks to his uh, work, uh, an arrest, uh, international arrest warrants were issued so Ali Mamluk today could not be able to come back to Italy because there is an international warrant against him which has been issued by Germany thanks to the case that he's putting together. So this is just an example. Uh, before I let Anwar speak and, uh, um, and uh, tell us about the case, I want to just tell a few words about you, can I? <laughs> he's a human rights lawyer, I would say the human rights lawyer in Syria. He has been working on this topic for 30 years, and uh, you should say if it's true, but <laughs> I, I read you started. Uh, he's from Hama in Syria, a very famous place. He started after, in 81, uh, the army came to Hama and beaded him, burned his beard, and that was the beginning of his interest in, in human rights. Uh, Anwar spent uh, several years in prison. He was arrested in 2006 for signing up a declaration which asked for more freedom in, uh, uh, in Syria, press freedom and this kind of stuff. Um, uh, he survived not only the prison itself, but an attempt 
uh, direct attempt to, to kill him while he was in prison because he has been targeted by the Syrian regime for his work. Basically, he is the person who defended human rights in Syria for the last 30 years. And uh, right now, he is the nightmare of people like Ali al-Mamluk. Can you tell us about the case? Good morning, everybody. Uh, before I speak about uh, the case and why uh, we follow justice in Syria, I want to speak about how much justice in Syria and for Syria it's so important for all the world and special, specific for Europe. What happened before from horrible crimes in Rwanda, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, in Sudan, in many places in all the world, continued because the criminals feel they can, they can escape from punishment. The experience of justice before was very bad to give example or to send message to the criminals or properly criminals, they must to stop to do like crimes. Unless like that in Colombia, they give prize, Nobel Prize for peace for the horrible criminals who committed horrible crimes in Colombia. When they make agreement, they give them Nobel Prize. Wow. So that who encourage the others to, okay, we can do what we want and we can escape at last. What happened in Syria or what will happen in Syria will affect about whole the world and specific in Europe because Europe in the first front line to face all the thing happened specific in the Middle East and North Africa. All the dictatorship now, or properly dictatorship, who think to be like that, look for destiny of the Syrian regime and Syrian criminals who committed all these crimes against humanity and war crime. If they survived, all together, we can imagine what will we happen if Sisi in Egypt or Erdogan in Turkish or Bouteflika in Algeria or others feel comfortable. Okay, we can do what we want. If the Syrian crisis sent one million refugees to Europe because seven million contained with the country around. From Turkish, 20 million, they will not find way unless see Greece or Istanbul, Bulgaria. From Egypt, 20 million, they will not go to Sudan or Israel or Libya, they will go to sea and Italia, Greece. From Algeria, same. So for that accountability for Syrians, it can change all this. It can send message to all those. You cannot do what you want in your country. It's our interest because we will be attacked from your crimes. It will touch us. So somebody may be, okay, we want to stop the war. It's not about stop the war now. It's stop all the war in all the world. It will be can continue if we stop it with a bad way. Just let us don't listen somebody cry or somebody suffering. Keep them. It's not the solution for our future. All of us, not for Syrians only. It's not a good way to save our future. 
in Syria, in Middle East, in Europe, in other, maybe in Venezuela, maybe in, in Iran, China, if you want to save our future, we must to focus about accountability. What we did, it's maybe historical step because we start justice now, before the everything end. The experience before, okay, the end, the crisis end, finish. Okay, we look, maybe give amnesty to everybody. Maybe, okay, make limited to the justice. Can, you can't touch this or this or like that, or not. This time we started it before everything end. And it's still the, the crimes committed. We, we depend about survivors who suffering, who really not just suffering, who's really survivor from death, from the jail in Syria, from the detention at the regime. Until now, there is 150 person missing, disappearing in Syria in regime uh, detention. 150,000. Thousand, yeah. 150,000. 150,000. 70,000 of them dead from torture, from the conditioner. Maybe uh, the, the film of Sarah, uh, she, she will speak about it. She, she, she will uh, explain what the kind of torture, what kind of, of suffering, what kind of the people, how they die uh, 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 in, in detention. So I will not be long, but that's what the first message we, we, we try to work together for our future, not for Syrian, just for our future, to do something to change. Thank you very much. So when we chose the title of this, this conference, we said memory and justice, uh, because there is another part of this story, which is memory, and this is what Hadi is going to talk about. Uh, Hadi is the founder of the Syrian Archive, which is a website which is trying to prevent all the documents, and especially all the videos that came out of Syria uh, during the revolution. Donatella Della Ratta, who was here uh, with me last year, just published a book uh, um, which is called Shooting a Revolution. And she explains very well that Syria has been the first civil war, war revolution, which has been streamed live all over the world. So there are thousands and thousands of hours of, of videos uh, which came out of Syria. But from these videos, you have several questions to, to address. I mean, are they real? Is it fake news or is it real? Where do they come from? Where were they should? I mean, who did it? And then there is another part, which is like, what's going to happen in the future? Uh, Hadi will explain us why now they are struggling to save these videos, because YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook are canceling, deleting more and more of these videos. So the risk is that we no longer have any evidence of what happened. And the other big risk is that the regime is building up his own narrative for the future. So they are already creating their narrative for the future, which is what they want to feed to the next generations. So kids who are going to go to school in the next five years, 10 years are going to be told that this is the story of what happened in these eight years. Hadi is trying to save the story, the other part of the story. And now he's going to explain us how. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, he's Syrian. I, I forgot to introduce. <laughs> Hadi is Syrian. He fled uh, from Syria in 2011 uh, because uh, he was going to be called in the military. So like many people left the country before he had to go uh, to serve in the military, and now he's based in Berlin. Thanks, Francesca. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, I will take uh, 
<clears throat> few minutes to um, talk to you about uh, what we are doing in terms of uh, archiving and why we are doing it. Um, so we are basically only trying to create a counter narrative to the disinformation that is published by all actors in the Syrian conflict. Uh, and we are trying to do this through collecting, verifying, and archiving videos and photos, so all visual documentation related to human rights violations in Syria by all sides. And we are doing it for three main reasons. One of the reasons is to use it to support advocacy research, so human rights re research uh, that is uh, done by international human rights organizations. The second thing is to assist in legal case building, so what lawyers are working on, for example, like what my colleague uh, Anwar Bunni is working on. This, the third thing is related to uh, support any type of transitional justice in the future through building and constructing the memory of the Syrian people uh, between 2011 and 2018. And we have been doing this work with so many other organizations. We have been building this methodology and workflow uh, as a collaboration uh, since years. We started in 2014. And with many organizations, we were able to uh, create tools, workflows, methodologies, techniques in order to do this work. Um, because as Francesca have said, Syria is one of the most documented conflict in history. Um, we depended from the first days of the revolution on user-generated content because there was a lack of access uh, because of the security, uh, also because um, international journalists were not possible to go to Syria uh, anytime they want and to go to any crime scene they want and investigate whatever they want. It was very much monitored. And the people that went there, uh, they were very much uh, monitored and directed towards specific locations. So user-generated content was very important for us to understand what happened. And there was a very huge milestone came uh, two years ago when the International Criminal Court used for the first time in history uh, posts that were videos published on Facebook to actually issue a warrant of arrest against war criminal in Libya. So this is where we see, uh, for us Syrians, this is very important right now. We understand that this information, if it's credible and verified in a proper way and packaged and presented in a proper way, it could be actually used in courts. <clears throat> this is the actual warrant of arrest where we see that it's all dependent on Facebook posts that has been verified, and this is very important for us. But while doing this work, we are facing many challenges. It's related to uh, what Francesca has mentioned, the content is being lost because it's all um, uh, digital content, uh, it's all on devices like computers and mobile phones that are being all um, damaged because of many different reasons, because of the cyber attacks that happened against all journalists that has been publishing this content from 2011 until now, and also because of the social media companies uh, and what they have been using to actually uh, detect uh, this content automatically through the use of machine learning and computer vision. So what happened that uh, the social media companies like YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter are using uh, machine learning uh, in order to automatically detect uh, propaganda and terrorism content. Um, and they have started using this in 2017, and they have deleted hundreds of thousands uh, of videos just based on that. <clears throat> so that happened <clears throat> without a single human review. That means a machine will go to the internet, will decide what terrorist and propaganda content and what's not, and then content will be deleted. And with that, they destroyed a huge amount of the Syrian history and what has been also published by citizen reporters who risked their life to actually document what happened uh, in their areas uh, related to human rights violations. And that not just happened in Syria, but it's like uh, all around the world. So you can see here between July 2018 and September 2018, more than 7,800,000 uh, videos has been deleted through machine learning, so without a single human review, which is a very big problem for us right now that we are facing. And I think other uh, countries will be facing, and this directly uh, affects uh, freedom of expression, especially in closed societies like Syria and other countries as well. And it will also definitely affect any type of peace process, justice process, as long as there is no documentation, uh, there is no evidence, there is no transitional justice, there is no uh, justice at all, and we then keep on this circle. Uh, this is very important because also um, 
evidence is being destroyed by the Syrian government as we are right now in 2019 controlling most of Syria and they are destroying every, any kind of evidence and we are only kept with this digital evidence that, that right now it's maybe the only information we know about any incident that has happened or any crime that has happened. Through our database we detected in 2017 that YouTube was using machine learning and they deleted hundreds of thousands of videos uh, between 2017 and 2018 and this is still happening until mm -hmm. now. But even with that, we have been archiving, so we have more than three million uh, digital units related to the Syrian conflict uh, that we have verified only about 5,000 uh, out of them. But this is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing, uh, which is uh, priority is archiving because everything is getting lost. And the other uh, challenge is related to the misinformation that has been published by all actors in the Syrian conflict. Um, and. Uh, this is why it's really important to verify everything that we acquire. Uh, because, for example, like this example, uh, we see many different actors, like this one, for example, the Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, publishing videos. Uh, this example is about how the US is covering an operation for ISIS, moving equipments between uh, Iraq and Syria. And they use for that uh, this video, which is actually uh, a, sc a screenshot from um, a game video that has been published on YouTube. Uh, so this is uh, the, the level of misinformation and propaganda that is happening uh, in the Syrian conflict by, by all actors, uh, including governments, as we can see here. So this is how we really need to do a verification. Uh, sorry, this is another example. I'm just going to... Uh, this is about Syrian uh, people moving uh, to Europe, uh, but also like a, another propaganda, but this is also why it's really important to do verification. Uh, but I'm just gonna quickly go through that. So this is how we do verification. We acquire the video, for example, like this one, an airstrike happening. We uh, identify all landmarks related to a video. Uh, we identify all landmarks while journalists are moving around the crime scene. And then we identify, of course, if there are any civilians in the area, if it's a civilian area or not. In this case, it was a civilian area. We can see children also there. And then we move into uh, Google Earth to try to geolocate the same location that has been actually attacked, just to make sure that we are as much possible as accurate. So we actually get to the street where the photographer was making this photo, just to make sure that it's, it's verified. Uh, and once we do that, we use satellite imagery to, to understand what happened before uh, the attack and after the attack and see the impact uh, on the crime scene that happened. And in some cases, we are also able to see remnants of munitions, like this one, for example, that if we look for online, we are able to see that this is a cluster munition, uh, Russian-produced, uh, and uh, it's uh, usually used in containers like this one. Uh, so hundreds of them will be in this container. It will target civilian locations in a very random way and uh, make uh, a very big damage to, to, to civilians. And it's a war crime also to use it, uh, especially against uh, civilian locations. Of course, uh, the narrative also comes in from the Res Russian Ministry of Defense that they don't have this type of uh, weapons in Syria but also through videos related to uh, Russia today that they have published by journalists that were covering their operation, you can see that actually those uh, submunitions and the containers were actually on their aircraft while they were operating in Syria. So this is uh, an actual war crime that is happening using incendiary and cluster munitions against uh, civilians. This is why verification is important. This is why also we are going through it. The third challenge related uh, to this is uh, this content is very scattered all over the internet um, because people are using many different platforms to publish this content. So it's not really centralized and it's really hard to find. And this is why we created metadata schema in order to tag every information, uh, every video and photo we take with information so we're able to find it. And through that we are able to create uh, patterns and we are able to understand more the strategies of how the military, for example, were uh, doing uh, their operations and why they did that. Uh, the same thing for any uh, group that were responsible for, um, for human rights violations. Uh, so we can create timeline, understand strategies, uh, and all of that. But also it's really important for us to use this user-generated content to uh, understand the chain of command, who was actually responsible for, for crimes. So it's not just uh, important for us to understand what happened at the crime scene, but also who was involved 
who is the military personnel that were there. This is uh, one example from uh, Al-Quds Brigade uh, that were in Yarmouk camp, a Palestinian camp, that they were doing looting uh, as they were uh, actually in the camp. I mean, you can see a lot of information on them online um, uh, being also supported by the Russian government, and uh, we see their names, we see their signature, and all of that is, is online. And so this is how we do this type of investigation. So all these uh, techniques and tools are published uh, on our website because we want to make sure that whatever we work on is also available for all journalists in many different countries in order to understand um, how we are working and be able to use it in case it's useful uh, for their archiving or verification um, purposes. The last information we are facing, and I think I will end up here, is related to the scale. Uh, so Syria is one of the first and most documented uh, conflict in history. Uh, this will be definitely the same in other conflict in the future. Uh, and um, we are eight people right now. A lot of us work part time. And as any civil society organizations, it's definitely short on, on, on funding. Uh, so we need to find creative solutions in order to go through this content. And uh, what we are able to do right now, we, we try to do uh, machine learning capabilities uh, in order to identify contents automatically. And we focused on legal munitions. Uh, so right now, uh, the software will be able to go through all the data, capture legal munitions, and prioritize it for journalists in order to see how they, how they can use it. Um, this is the cluster munition that you have seen that was also used during the, the attack in, in Aleppo. So we are focusing on that. Um, and this is the result will be something like this. Uh, so then uh, all this will be going into uh, 3 million videos and uh, prioritizing some of them in order for us to, to verify them. So this is some of the solutions we are trying to, to think about. And of course, we are trying to publish all open source and free available for all journalists in order to be used them. Uh, also uh, for, for their uh, investigations. Uh, but this is how we are creating memory, this is how we are creating uh, this type of collection, so it's important for the future for any legal case as well as for constructing the, the, the collective memory of society that is all mainly right now digital. Okay. Thank you very much, Hadi. I want to stress once again that most of this material is available online for everybody uh, on the website of the Syrian Archive. Um, Hadi, you said uh, human rights violation by all sides, and this is very important to stress, to underline. I mean, uh, uh, what started as a pacific uh, re uh, revolution turned out into a bloody civil war. And uh, uh, I must say that in the last years, there is nobody is innocent in Syria. There is no good and bad. I mean, uh, except the people who started the revolution. That's another story. I'm talking about this, the, the, the militias, the groups uh, that are, are fighting um, on, uh, on the ground. But there is one part, and that's how I get to Sarah, which is responsible for systematic attack to human rights, systematic use of torture, systematic elimination of so-called enemies. And when I say so-called enemies, it's because I mean not only people who are fighting, but people like Bastel Carterville, about whom we, we, we spoke, we were here, we were talking about him last year, he was a geek, he was a web expert, he was trying to teach to the people how to shoot videos of the revolution. He was arrested, he was tortured, he was killed. So this is what Sarah works uh, on. This is the subject of her work. Uh, Sarah shot a wonderful documentary which is called The Syria Disappeared, the, the case against Bashar al-Assad. And I'm sorry, but we don't have enough time to show it. <laughs> so even the short version would have been 16 minutes, and we only have one hour or so. Uh, but uh, I strongly invite you to look for it on Amazon Prime, because it's really wonderful. Um, so uh, she, in this documentary, she speaks to families of people who disappeared, survivors, defectors. Uh, and she explains what's the case, what's the story of the disappeared, and what's the evidence that is collected to be uh, against, as you say, to, to build up the case uh, against Bashar al-Assad. Uh, before I let you talk, I want to say something that happened last night. We were having a conversation at dinner, so a friend asked Sarah, is, uh, is your movie political? 
and uh, we were sitting together. Um, and I said yes, and she said no. <laughs> and she's right, because her movie is not political. I mean, it's about what happened. Uh, she let people speak. But I was right, too, because at the end of the, of the day, it becomes political, because all the evidence points in the same direction. So, Sarah, what's the case against Bashar al-Assad? What's the evidence? And what did all these people that you met, you met and you interviewed, told you? Hi. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, thank you for coming. Thank you, Francesca. Um, yeah, so uh, my film went out in March 2017. I worked on it from the end of 2014, so I worked on it for years. Um, and really what motivated me to make it was that in 2014, some photographs were released. Um, they had been smuggled out of Syria by a defector, and they showed um, thousands of corpses of people who had been detained by the Syrian regime. Um, these. Um, the photographs are horrific, and I, I really actually urge you to, to, to look at them. They're called the Caesar photographs, um, and you, you can see them online, and you can see them in my documentary. They're, the photographs of, are of corpses that are severely emaciated, um, so many of the detainees were, were starved to death. There's signs of torture uh, on the bodies. There are eyes gouged out. There are children in these photos, boys, you know. You can see that, you know, some of them have been uh, hanged, chemicals have been used on them. Um, really, when I saw these photographs, I thought that they were reminiscent of photographs from the Holocaust. They're that horrific. And I really thought that they would have a huge impact on what was happening um, in Syria and that the international community would do something because, you know, this was such strong evidence of, you know, what the regime was doing to civilians who they had detained. Um, but uh, unfortunately, you know, there was a Security Council resolution to refer Syria to the International Criminal Court um, in May 2014 partly based on these photographs, and um, that was vetoed by Russia and China. Um, and then really after that, the whole issue of what was going on to detainees just seemed to be swept under the carpet by the international community. And then everybody's focus turned to ISIS because it was at the time when ISIS was coming to the fore in the conflict. And so I was really motivated to try and make a film just looking at this one issue. Um, and, you know, as Francesca said, I spoke to families of the disappeared. You know, families who, they've been waiting years to, you know, their, their, their loved ones were disappeared in 2011 or 2012. You know, they've been waiting five, six years to... To, to find out what happened to them with no news whatsoever from, from the regime. Um, but one person I spoke to in the film, um, she's a mother, uh, Mariam Halak, um, and, she's, and her son was a dentistry graduate, um, a peaceful protester. Um, he also um, worked for a human rights organization documenting some of the disappearances. Then he was disappeared, um, and she um, was searching him for him for 18 months, you know, day in, day out, going to government offices, you know, places where she could have been arrested herself for asking these questions, because really you can't even ask these questions in Syria. But she just kept pursuing this and pursuing this, and, um, you know, really fortuitously, she managed to get some documentation from the Syrian regime something that referred to a corpse number, um, and it had the number, corpse number 320. Um, and then she found the photo of her son in the Caesar photographs. So what I should have mentioned is that the Caesar photographs, there are no names on the bodies, but there are numbers, so corpse numbers for each corpse and a detention facility number, um, because there are many detention facilities um, and each individual is labeled um, with the detention facility number. So 
she was actually able to get you know, documentary evidence from the regime that corroborated the photograph. I mean, you know, the regime didn't realize that's what it was doing, but this is how, what she managed to do through her efforts. Um, and now she's actually joined the case that Anwar um, has filed in Germany. Um, so to try to, you know, pursue justice in that way, because again, in, in my film, she's very clear that, you know, she wants justice, she wants justice through the law. And, you know, um, the other people that we spoke to in the film as well, um, torture survivors who, you know, have been through horrific experiences, you know, um, you, you can't really imagine it. Um, you know, one man that I spoke to, um, you know, a clamp was put around his genitals and, you know, squeezed until he confessed. Um, and this was after, you know, many, many hours um, and, and days of, of torture. Um, obviously, he gave a false confession. That's, you know, that's what often happens in detention. People give false confessions because, you know, otherwise they're going to be killed. They're threatened, you know, with, with death. And he was in detention for 18 months. Um, but, you know, after everything that he went through, again, he was very clear that he wanted justice through the law. And that's why, you know, the case that Anwar is working on and also the work that Hardy is doing is so important because, you know, this stuff cannot be swept under the carpet. Um, you know, um, the things can't move forward without there being a justice process. You know, sometimes people say, oh, why do you talk about this? You know, you're preventing peace by talking about this. But, you know, you, as, as the saying goes, you cannot have peace without justice. Um, and really, the thing that I want to stress more than anything is that, you know, as, as Anwar mentioned, there are tens of thousands of people disappeared in Syria. You know, there are so many people still in detention. There are still people being arrested and detained now. You know, some people who went back, they were arrested and detained. Um, you know, because sometimes people go back because their families are there and they haven't been able to have reunification in, uh, in Europe. And so they go back and they've been arrested and detained. And we know about the torture that goes on. We have all of the evidence. Um, you know, I've never worked on an investigation where I had so much evidence. I had so much evidence, I couldn't fit it all into the film, you know. Um, so I really want to stress that people are still there today in these horrific places where they are tortured um, and nothing has been done to try to release them. Nothing has even been done to get independent monitors to go into these places. Because, you know, for years now, Amnesty International and also there, there's a group, Families for Freedom, who are the mothers um, and wives and sisters of the disappeared, they have been asking for independent monitors to go into these places um, for information, any information about their loved ones. You know, they want to know, you know, if the if their loved one is dead, they want to know that. They want to know where, where are they buried. You know, Mariam still doesn't know where her son is buried. She, you know, and that's a, a huge issue. Um, and obviously they want the release of the detainees, but nothing is being done about that. And I would say it's an urgent humanitarian crisis. It really is, but it's hidden. It's hidden. No one can see it. Um, you know, obviously when there's these terrible, you know, bombings, you can see that. But, you know, what's... The, I feel like these people have been forgotten um, and even though there's you know, good news about what's happening in the justice process, in the process of actually trying to free these people, nothing has happened. And at the same time, we have what Francesca was talking about, this kind of movement towards you know, some countries wanting to normalize the Syrian regime, um, you know, and people talking about, you know, oh, m yeah, money for reconstruction and, you know, companies wanting to go in and, and so on. And, you know, all I can stress to you is that these places are like concentration camps. 
they're in Syria now and people are in there being tortured. So how on earth can we normalize relations with that regime or do anything when that is happening? Because it would be like during the Second World War if you knew about the concentration camps and then you just decided like, that's fine and you know, here's some money for the Nazi Germany. You know, that, that's what it's like. Um, and it's, 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 it's even barely talked about, really. Thank you, Sarah. Once again, I want to stress out that there are 150,000 people who are missing today in Syrians prisons, and that the regime just started publishing some list of the people that were killed uh, last summer. Uh, they started releasing all these names of people who have been dead for years, and the families didn't know uh, anything. The other thing that I would like to say is that the Caesar files are this huge amount of pictures which have been smuggled out of Syria by a defector. Uh, we don't know his name, he's of course under protection, and uh, it's going to be the, the, the base for, for the case uh, against the Syrian regime. I want to leave the last 10 minutes for questions, so uh, very fast and word, the only, uh, I want to ask you the last thing and then we leave the floor open to questions. Uh, there are good news in the search for justice because Three people have been arrested, and this is the beginning of uh, a long story, we hope. When we met, we were talking about Pinochet. Can you just briefly explain to, to the people what's going to happen? What's the good news? The good news, in fact, uh, it's uh, some countries in Europe uh, uh, feel responsible about what happened in whole the world from whole terrible uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes and add to its laws article allowed to hear or its uh, justice to look in this case until the crimes ha didn't happen on its land or the perpetrators or victims not exist on their land. So it's, we, we call it universal jurisdiction, who uh, uh, German add it for its law in 2002, and uh, Sweden and Norway and uh, Austria add it in 2014. It was exist in Spain and in Belgium uh, unfortunately, uh, they cancel it uh, in Belgium and Spain because uh, they feel embarrassing Spain because uh, the case of Pinochet that uh, was almost arrested uh, and they, uh, he, he can uh, run away and they cancel this and uh, uh, Belgium uh, cancel it because the uh, case against Sharon, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, so uh, we are lucky some countries, some people feel responsible about that. Uh, and we use this universal jurisdiction in Germany and in uh, Sweden and Austria uh, to build case and target preparators, high ranking officer uh, in Syria who are responsible about torture, kill the, the uh, detainees in, in jail. I will not. Uh, I will add something about why justice so far important for us. What most dangers we face it in the future? I think there is one that's terrorism, that's our enemy, all of us, and for Europe and others immigration or refugees, it's also dangerous for, for, for them, for you. How we can face, fight against this danger? I think, and I think I am right, justice. Because when the people don't find, when the victim don't find peaceful way 
to have their justice. It will be very good land to the terrorism organization and radical idea to serve them. When the people disappointing, hopeless, nobody helps them until everybody saw what they suffering, how much there are victims, and nobody care. They will be good grant to the radical use them to have their rights or revenge. We can't fight, nobody can fight the idea of terrorism. It exists from the long, long, long time in all the region, in, in all the uh, nationality. The, the terrorism idea it exists. We can't fight it to don't allow it for this idea to have people believe or support or adopt. And the selective justice is more danger. When we use or select, we need to attack these crime, criminals. For this crime, and forget others and others, okay, I don't care with this, but that may be danger of me that make more hopeless. And that times we, you will be enemy to others, not just, okay, uh, I care because I interest, you will be enemy. That means you support the other. So the selective justice is more danger. When I choose, I will charge or uh, attack this kind of criminal and I will not care about the other criminals, how much they do. For that also, that's who push waves of refugees. Because the people will look to secure, to save place. Beside, these criminals will come to you at last to have safe place. And it will be danger for your society in the future. If we don't send to them from now, message, there is no safe place will accept you. They will come at last and hide in your society as what we saw before in Nazis and uh, in, in Yugoslavia, last Yugoslavia, until now that we look where these preparators disappear. We can do that from now. Thank you very much. I think this is something that we have to keep in our minds while we finish this conference. We only have five more minutes, so if some of you have questions, you're more than welcome, but it has to be very short, <laughs> because it's only five minutes, please. Uh, is there a microphone or maybe, okay, thank you. I mean, thank you, everyone. But I would like to ask Hadi, I've, I've heard you talk and present this so many times, and I'm still like awestruck by the amount of work that needs to be done, I can't even fathom. So just quickly on YouTube, since this is about journalism and Google is here and, sure. and what's up and Facebook and stuff. Uh, <laughs> so you have to ask, right? Uh, the thing with YouTube removing millions of videos, I know that you've been directly in negotiation with them about these things and about bringing back accounts. Can you quickly say, have they permanently deleted them when they delete, or have they been willing to hand them over to you, for example, or other organizations? Like, what, what, are, what are the conversations that are happening right now? And there, is there hope, even from the media side, to put more pressure on them to uh, bring back memories, if you like? Able to um, give back some of the videos, to reinstate some of the videos if you have information about the videos that they were deleted. So if you have information uh, about uh, the videos, what are those videos exactly? What's, what's in the video? What is the source of the video? What is the, the video about? Then they will reinstate it. Yes, otherwise, if you don't have this type of evidence and metadata, then they won't do it. So this is one of the biggest challenges. Luckily for us, we had preserved this before. So we had the files, we know what the files is, we know it's not propaganda, it's not extremism, it's like literally targeting, for example, a medical facility. Uh, and they mentioned that this is a big mistake that they have done. Uh, right now, 
this year we are in a different situation, especially after the GDPR, because I don't know for how long, if they deleted the video, it will be on their servers. Um, I think it will be for a limited time, but we don't have any public information about this from social media companies, including uh, Google. Um, thank you so much for um, your presentation and everything that you guys are doing. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the cases that have been brought at the domestic level, given that the International Criminal Court is, seems like it's not able to do anything here because of Russia and China having veto power. Um, I was wondering if you think that enough can be done to bring justice for Syrians um, in domestic courts. Uh, yeah, ICC, uh, International Criminal Court, closed for Syria. For that, we use this universal jurisdiction who uh, uh, have uh, in, in Germany and Norway and Austria and Sweden. And we uh, filled four cases in front of uh, German prosecutor and uh, really they uh, issued arrest warrants uh, against several of the preparators from the high level uh, ranking. Uh, and we waiting for more, including for sure Bashar al-Assad himself because he is not as president responsible about what happened because he is himself committed crime. Uh, when he signed at least 15,000 uh, order to kill the people inside Naya prison outside law. So uh, uh, he committed crimes himself. Uh, besides that, there is a case in, in French because two victims in detention killed was French nationality. So that give the uh, judge uh, in French uh, capacity able to open case and expand with it to make it crimes against the humanity against 10,000 detainees. And they arrest, uh, issued arrest warrants against uh, Ali Mamluk, Jamil Hassan, head of Intelligentsia, uh, Air Force Intelligentsia, and Abdul Salam Mahmoud, the head of investigation branch in uh, Air Force Intelligentsia. Ali Mamluk, the head of the National Office uh, uh, Security in Syria. He is responsible about all the security branches and uh, department. Uh, in uh, Sweden also we submit file last month and we're waiting to continue. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, in Europe there is no trail in absent. So we just wait to arrest warrant issued and that means they will start trail if they catch the perpetrators. So, and in, in another side, we follow the criminals, and we thought, and uh, know, there is about 1,000 criminals arrived to Europe as refugees. So we uh, tried to find them, building case against them, and we succeed to uh, catch three, two in Germany and one in French, who committed crimes against the humanity was responsible about torture detainees and killed them under torture. And we continue to find all those preparators for Syria and for Europe to save the, the community because most of them sent by mission to make problem, to commit crimes against the Syrian opposition or like that. So we, we try to continue our work to find them and building case and let them face justice. So this is why it's the worst nightmare of the Syrian regime, <laughs> once again. <laughs> so I'm afraid we have to close, uh, sorry, but um, they are gonna be here. There is another panel after us, so I was checking the program, but unfortunately we have to close. I just wanna ask, close with one thing. We were having a coffee and I asked Anwar, where is the trial going to happen? All this case that you're building, where do you expect it to happen? And I thought he was going to say Germany, but he said Syria. OK. Uh, in fact, we, uh, for the people who arrested in Germany, maybe we wait last of the of year uh, uh, open trial against them. It will be open. Uh, but for other work in, against the people who is in Syria, our target may be to cut them, but the main one to push them outside Syria future. When the judge, ju justice told them, you, or, or 
publish they are criminals that cut any way to anybody to think we can connect with them or, or rebuild their rehabilitation, how they can be part of Syrian future in the transition uh, period or after or like that. We try to cut the way to rebuild these uh, 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 people or these criminals and that the, uh, really, really, it will be victory for us because like I told you in the history, many times same criminals be same president or same uh, parties uh, and uh, involved with the society and they will be a temporary bomb they will explode in the, in the future. And we have uh, experience in, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in others. Every place who make this deal, they make bomb. It will be explosion in the future. So we need our future safe. Without this small bomb will be planned in the Syrian future. So it's not over. I mean, it's not an Arab spring, uh, and it's not an Arab winter, as we were discussing. No, no, yes, the story spring. is still going on. It's spring, and it's still spring. It's not spring for Syria and Arab world. It's spring for whole the world, in fact. Thank you very much.